by Avo Technology. Weighing a hefty 15,000 pounds, the vault was opened like a rolling steel door. As its height continued to rise, the robbers seized their opportunity. One after another, they rolled into the vault, finding the royal vault of Paris empty. Despite this, the robbers' faces lit up with satisfaction. No one in the world would have thought that a gang of thieves would go to such lengths to break into an empty vault. Zira quickly relayed the news to the commander outside. Now, all they had to do was wait like sitting ducks for the European nobles to unwittingly deliver their ancestral treasures right into the robbers' hands. In anticipation of the auction gala in a few days, European nobles were transporting their most prized possessions into the vault. The auctioneer, handling a crown with utmost care, placed the last item for the upcoming auction inside the vault before exiting. Following standard protocol, several locks were secured on the vault. Even with the keys, it would take half an hour to reopen the vault door. However, the robbers, fully armed and ready, didn't wait for the auctioneer to leave. Wearing special clothing to avoid leaving fingerprints or any traceable evidence, they commenced their mission. The team's hacker had replaced the live security footage with a pre-recorded video, ensuring that the guards outside remained unaware of the robbers' activities inside. The clock started ticking. The bulldozer removed the previously dug up concrete, and the robbers, familiar with their path, re-entered the cavity. As all the live footage was replaced, the crane began its operation, and the 15,000 pound rolling door was opened once again. Berlin reminded the team members that after removing the jewels, they must put all the boxes back in their original places. He wanted to make the police investigation utterly fruitless. After giving these instructions, he rolled into the vault, which was no longer empty. Each item inside was a priceless treasure. Berlin approached the vault door to listen. The jewelry manager, only two meters away on the other side of the door, was signing and stamping documents, completely unaware of the people behind the door. This was going to be a heist that neither God nor ghosts would notice. The team members acted swiftly. The auction house had already assigned numbers to the exhibits, inadvertently facilitating the robbers in tallying their loot. For each piece of jewelry they took, they informed the technician outside of the corresponding number, ensuring nothing was missed. The heist proceeded methodically, and soon all the jewels were in the robbers' pockets. But they were well aware this was just the first step. The key to the mission was how to safely transport these treasures. With only five hours left until dawn, they needed to clear any traces of their presence before the start of the auction gala. Using a welding torch prepared in advance, they restored the vault to its original state and meticulously cleaned every detail, including the floor. Any careless trace left behind could become a clue for the police. The trickiest part was erasing the traces of their intrusion into the surveillance system. For this, the professor had devised a plan involving a high-voltage cable running underground. By connecting the auction house's line to it, they could generate a massive current in an instant burning out the entire power supply system, it was time for the robbers to act. Since the vault's security system had been triggered, they needed to contact an engineer to arrive at the scene and forcefully open the vault within six hours. Taking advantage of this opportunity, the professor quickly dealt with any traces on the surveillance equipment. After leaving, he restored the concrete to its original position and resealed it with the welding torch. This completed the handling of the electronic devices. The next step was to cover their tracks literally. They refilled the tunnel they had dug with concrete, ensuring that the bricks used for the refill were identical to the ones they had initially broken. All the tools they used, including the crane, were sealed inside the tunnel, leaving a mystery for future generations to unearth and reconstruct the events of the heist. Not only did they meticulously handle the heist scene, but to further mislead the police, Berlin also sneaked into the auctioneer's house. There, he took a tag from one of the stolen jewels, burnt it with a lighter, and deliberately left inconspicuous ashes at the scene. He then used a flashlight to remove gems from the jewelry, hitting them in a corner of the sofa. This act created a misleading clue to divert the police's attention. The robbers returned to their hotel at staggered times, each carefully erasing any traces they had left in their rooms. The professor's job was more arduous. 
He had to divide the stolen jewels into several portions, place them in compression bags, and vacuum out the air to minimize their volume. He then packed them one by one into a can, sealed the lid with a sealing machine, and after vacuum packing, polished each can. Brand new, unopened cans appeared before him. Meanwhile, the vault was in complete disarray, with all the jewels mysteriously vanished. This level of heist shocked the police, who dispatched their best officers to investigate the incident. The chief detective quickly apprehended the auctioneer as a suspect. Unbeknownst to the robbers, disguised as tourists and boarding an inconspicuous bus on their way home, the scale of the crime, involving 34 pieces of jewelry, was so large that the owners collectively hired a top detective with a 100% case-solving rate. The thieves disguised themselves as a family of three on vacation, planning to easily cross the countryside road back to Spain. Unexpectedly, even on such a rural path, the police had set up checkpoints. Matt quickly packed the cans of sardines into a bag, preparing to escape through a secret passage under the RV. However, in such open wilderness, they had nowhere to run. With no other choice, the thieves took a gamble. When their vehicle was stopped, the police, armed with rifles, conducted a thorough search. Upon opening a cupboard and discovering numerous cans of sardines, they were instead drawn to an urn placed amidst them. The police informed them that scattering ashes could harm the environment and decided to confiscate the urn. Matt was outraged, questioning the freedom and equality tutored in France. Despite their apologies, the police were determined to follow the rules. <laughs> Just as it seemed the jewels would be discovered, Annie grabbed the urn and frantically ran away. Despite the police firing warning shots, she didn't stop. Left with no choice, a police officer fired a shot, and Annie collapsed to the ground in agony, crying over the treatment of her mother's ashes. During the struggle, the ashes were scattered on the ground. Sobbing, she painstakingly gathered her mother's ashes back into the urn. This tragic scene filled the on-site police with guilt, especially the officer who had fired the shot. They decided to let this grieving family go, moved by their apparent plight. After leaving, they quickly contacted their other two accomplices, warning them that the police had set up checkpoints on all roads. They decided to camp in the nearby wilderness for a few days, waiting for the situation to cool down before leaving Paris. Little did they know that this decision would lead to deep regret. During a patrol by the lake, the police spotted the supposed siblings with the urn. However, their overly intimate behavior raised suspicions, leading the captain to realize that the identity of the family of three was a facade. After reporting this, Detective Julie instantly deduced that the jewels were hidden inside the cans. The police immediately surrounded the thieves' RV. Realizing their cover was blown, the thieves resorted to their backup plan. Pressing a button, a mechanical arm holding a megaphone extended from a window. Matt, through a radio, informed the police that he had explosives on him and threatened to blow everything up if they approached. The police maintained a safe distance from the RV. After negotiations, the police agreed to give the thieves five minutes to think it over. If they revealed the location of the jewels, their sentence would be reduced. Matt gave them an address through the megaphone, but the astute Julie instantly realized it was a ruse. The angle and speed of the megaphone's appearance were always the same, indicating they were just stalling for time. Boldly, she pushed open the door of the RV and found it to be a trick set up by the thieves to escape. With no roads in sight, the only possible exit was underneath their feet. The bottom cover of the RV was perfectly aligned with the sewer, providing an escape route. Dozens of SWAT officers rushed in, determined to catch the fleeing thieves. Matt and his partner escaped through a manhole and, spotting the surrounding trucks, devised a brilliant escape plan. They took a glue gun and crawled on top of a vehicle. Matt cut a piece of cloth from a nearby vehicle and adhered it to their chosen truck, creating a concealed space large enough to hide them. By this time, a large number of SWAT officers had reached the area around the manhole, and the truck was preparing to leave. It was stopped by the officers, who demanded to inspect the cargo area. Hearing the commotion, Matt and his partner quickly grabbed onto the undercarriage supports. The SWAT officers inspected the cargo area, finding it empty, but still decided to check the top of the truck. Matt and Annie simply shifted their position to let their bodies sink lower, avoiding detection. 
It appeared that the thieves were not hiding there, so the truck passed the inspection smoothly. An old man, who had narrowly escaped capture while fishing, left the scene on his motorcycle. After enduring many hardships, the thieves finally regrouped at a villa in the outskirts of Spain, where their plan came to a successful conclusion.